Okay, let's see if this works. Stick around 700, it should be okay. I'm not sure it turns it well enough, but we'll jump in and we'll see what we can do. Um, Maybe that it doesn't like me streaming both on um, Discord and on Twitch. Um, so we can probably adjust to that. Um, I'm annoyed because I did not realize this was going to be a problem. So I'm sorry about that. Um, and I need to view the... There we go. So. Hmm. It appears that this evening I'm going to have some problems with streaming because my Twitch seems to not be happy with me. Um, hmm. Oh, and I've got so we've got Yeah, we've got quite a few of you um, in the the Discord chat, um, and I have my lecture here all ready to go. Uh, it looks like, therefore, I might have to um, this is going to be annoying and not give you guys a good experience. Then I might have to do this tomorrow when I'm in at work and have because uh, the moment I'm, I'm presenting from where I am um, <laughs> in uh, where I'm staying, because it's 10 o'clock at night and I'm staying in Wellington, I'm teaching in Wellington. However, I could be in the lab tomorrow morning, which would be night time, your time. Um, but then tomorrow night I could give one, but that would be Saturday. So I'd have to push this back to Monday, um, given the that we've got um, some challenges with uh, the video not streaming properly. Um, I could not do Twitch. We could try not doing Twitch. Um, and uh, I could try and do just do Discord uh, and see if Discord does any better. Um, and just share that one. Actually, the audio quality is good. Okay, the audio quality is fine. <laughs> Apparently, the audio quality is fine. Um, it looks like it's not sharing the proper... Well, at least it's sharing that. Um, well, I could go with this and we'll, we'll, we'll not do the... Um, Right, so the audio quality is acceptable, it's just the frame rate is really slow. Well, okay, so you won't get to see me this time, okay? Um, so long as you can hear me and you can see what I'm talking about, then this should be okay. It won't be as good as normal. Um, what I'll do is I'll actually, so I will, before I start, get my scene working properly. Because um, I've disconnected all my windows, I have to actually go into the view and turn my toolbars back on uh, and I'm looking for the uh, sources. Where did we go? View toolbars docs. There you go, you're hiding over there. Um, so I need to find that one and go to the settings and tell that one to go to something else and then go back to the webcam so it'll turn the webcam off. Okay. <sighs> Annoying things. Okay so um, 
at least I'm recording this, so when I upload it, I'll upload this one. So you'll see me doing my hand gestures, um, even if the frame rate's pretty slow in the live feed. Well, we'll see how it goes. Um, as long as the audio is good, hopefully that's fine. Uh, on Discord, are you guys okay with audio? Um, ah, we'll see how it goes. Um, if it's a terrible, terrible thing, um, then I can stop. Okay, at least you'll get to see the slides. Um, oh, and uh, therefore I should potentially uh, escape that and help you guys by sharing that and uh, copy link um, and it is being recorded so I'm recording this uh, so the recording is on so it definitely is being recorded um, that is the link to the Google Doc so at least if you can't see the Google Doc clearly in the lecture you'll be able to um, oh Did I not change anyone's link viewer? Done. Right, you should now be able to jump in there. Um, that will give you a chance of, of, of seeing the slides in full detail. Okay, so, um, yep, great, okay. Um, that means that if, if I cut out and can only hear me, at least you can sort of see the slides that I'm I'm hopefully referring to, um, and that you can go to present interview. Okay, sorry, it took me a while to get into this. Okay, so I'll pull that out so you can harass me in Twitch if you want to harass me live, and I'll go and check on Discord every now and again. Okay, so function pointers. Um, are a really neat tool that you can use with threads because threads are the idea that there is like processes running on your CPU function pointers are the idea that um, because functions are just another piece of, of code right um, just as you have pointers to ints and pointers to floats you can have pointers to functions right it's just you know it's a part of the memory so you can point at it function sits in memory somewhere uh, and by pointing to a function when you want to set a different function to run you can just point the function at you can just change the pointer and that points to a different block of code and so that code will execute when you change the pointer um, which is very powerful and can be quite useful when you're talking about threads because you can swap in a new pointer to a thread and get that new thread to run um, I will also talk very briefly about profiling um, and we'll talk about profiling more later. Um, it's actually quite useful when you've got your programs working. Right? So profiling helps you decide whether or not you are going to op optimize your code by including more threading. Um, but just profiling the program without you having the pro your own program to profile isn't as interesting. So I'll wait for you guys to have your code up and running to do that. And we can look at a wee bit of, of um, C++ and, and OpenMP. Okay, so threading. Threading is the backbone of multi-threaded programming, right? Um, oh. <coughs> so there are a bunch of explicit threads. Now we used to do this with P threads and boost. Uh, SDL, which is the foundation language that sits underneath Unreal, has threading built in. Some of you are using SFML, it has um, threads um, in SFML. And since C11, there have been native threads in C, so they actually basically took the boost threads and they rolled them into the C specification. Uh, and that's in 11, 14, 17, and now in the 20 spec. And there's the MPI, which is a uh, a, a multi-processor environment. So, um, P threads and SDL one point two are written in C. So, so rather than being C plus plus and being objects, these were lightweight threads written in C. 
AC from L and boost and the C plus plus stuff are all written C plus plus. ACL is is um, C plus plus friendly, um, so it actually operates on the C plus plus level and is it's more object oriented. Um, in SDL two point you have something called promises, which are used when you're threading and you promise to do something. So basically, it means that when you execute a thread, that thread will succeed, right? Because it's a promise to succeed. So the message passing interface is MPI um, is for distributed memory systems. So when you're thinking supercomputers, and supercomputers have lots of, of processing units and lots of, of distributed memory, um, the MPI the message pa um, passing interface allows you to do multi-threading between different machines with different memory uh, and the un and the entity um, Unity's entity component system. So about two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, Unity changed the core of its um, rendering and processing pipelines uh, and moved away from being a heavy OO implementation into a data-driven implementation, partly for optimization reasons. It wanted to be able to, to run faster. Uh, and to do that, it had to move away from moving heavy objects and references all around, the, um, around all the time and move to functions that would process lots of data, uh, particularly true for shaders and um, particle effects and things like that. As part of that, they moved to an entity component system that had jobs, so that the, basically the core of what you do in Unity became a multi-threaded engine. And that also means they changed the networking, and, and they're still working through that change process. Um, in Unreal, they have um, Parallel 4 and normal C++ threads, and you can do um, threaded behavior in the Unreal engine. Right, because you're um, implementing C. It also has um, OpenMP and, thing, and a few other things built in. So, when we're looking at parallel, multi-threaded programming, um, you've got to realize that it's not necessarily always your threads that are running. Um, so it's not just your threads that are, are using the CPU. And uh, some things, like on uh, OpenMP, create um, implicit threads. <laughs> so, sorry. So you don't have to actually, <laughs> you don't have to program the threads, right? Um, and say that you you want to spawn off a new thread and have it run. What you do is in the code you say, "Hey code, you're doing a for loop, for example. Can you just?" Do all of it in parallel for me, and the program and the and the compiler will spin up a whole bunch of threads for you, and the operating and the the um, game engine will spin up threads for you that you don't have to manage. Right, so they're implicit threads. Certainly, threading in the GPU where um, you have implicit threads where the operating system has worked out how to make your code run faster by separating bits of it off and running those. Uh, you can, of course, also do on the GPU explicit threads where you use CUDA programming OpenCL, which and the compute language, um, and Vulkan um, and stream programming on the GPU where you're explicitly communicating. Um, there's also some interesting like render and direct compute, which are other ways of doing multiple operations on your GPU card. Um, a lot of the threads are controlled by the library, a lot of these implicit threads, and most GPUs, in, um, because we're moving into the 2000 series and there are dedicated ray traces on board, there are also more and more general compute functionality that's being built into graphics cards. Uh, you can even just buy graphic cards which are designed around CUDA uh, and are well, you forget get ones that are uh, Bitcoin mining, for example. So there's a lot of hardware development in that, um, that side. And so some of what we're doing here, unless you are 
really, really certain that you need the speed, the amount of work you need to do to, to extract the speed out of the complex hardware may be quite high, right? So there is a trade-off to be had. And, you know, uh, if you're using a laptop and you're using lots of programs on that laptop, it'll already be running a lot of threads, right? There's a lot of threads from Firefox and from Chrome and from your operating system and from your game you play. Just everything you have open will start hitting some of the threads. So unless you can convince your, your player to restart their machine or you're on a console, it's hard to get a clean environment where there are very few other threads running. Right? So to some extent, when you're working on a clean machine, spreading yourself out across all of the CPU so you can use every single one of the cores that's in the, in the machine, that's great. Um, but, you know, if, it, if it's a normal working environment, then what you'll find is that the the user's machine is often already running a lot of threads, so you don't get a, you don't get as much game as you'd like because you're not the only threads running on their machine. Also, before we get into understanding how threading works, if you're actually worried about optimizing your code, then the thing you need to think about initially is often memory rather than threads, right? Because people think, oh, I'll make it multi-threaded; it will run faster. But often programs are memory locked rather than um, CPU bound, right? And it's because they can't move memory around fast enough. And you've got to kind of understand how your memory works if you're really going to make efficient systems. Uh, and this is particularly true in games where you have large assets like um, textures being moved around. If you move those textures around badly and you initialize them badly, then absolutely your performance will be terrible. Right? So um, yes, you can't just rely on, on the system being um, yeah, being completely empty and that it's the, the threads that are the problem rather than say, you know, you've got the textures are too large or your model is too large and that's what's slowing things down. Okay, so. If we're going to look at theoretically, when we do multi-threaded systems, and we, we're doing this with, with, with games, um, there's a, a, a principle, Umdahl's law, um, which is that because you can only parallelize some parts of your program, right? So um, if we're generous and we say that 90% of your program, the time spent in your program, could be parallelized, right? So let's say we've got some really, really big for loops and it, most of the work is happening inside that parallelizable for loop. There are some setup operations and then the parallel bit and then some exit operations, right? So, so there's some serial bits at the beginning and parallel in the middle and serial at the end. If you've only got 5% at the beginning, then 90% and 5% at the end, then two threads, you can get a 1.8 times speed up okay? and that's the formula there is that gives you this idea of how much can I speed up and that's one over the the one minus the parallel so basically how much serial there is divided by the parallel divided by the serial right so you oh the, the, sorry plus divided by that plus the number of the percent parallel divided by the number of threads, the S is the number of threads you're using, right? So, so the more threads, the more you make that, that, that parallel bit come closer and closer to zero. The problem is that, as you see with the, the 90 case there, we have 100 threads, we get a five times speed up, right? Runs five times faster, that's great, right? We're basically getting down to the 10% that's serial plus only a bit that's parallel. However, if only 40% of your code is serial and you have two threads, you can get a 1.25% time speed up, 100 thread, 1.5, 1,000 threads, 1.6. So just adding more threads just can't make it that much better, right? 
And the reason for that is because the serial part starts to dominate. It doesn't matter how fast you make the the um, parallel part. The parallel part's going to have a, a minimum processing time for each part of that parallel part. And at some point, you just get no improvements. Because right? you've already basically got rid of the bit. And if it's only a small part of the program, once you've got rid of it, you can't do any better. Okay, so... You can't just add more threads and expect everything to go faster, even if you've got a reasonably parallel processing task. Um, there is the word embarrassingly parallel. You need 90 plus, 90, 95% of the task to be parallel before it's embarrassingly parallel and you get this very good speed up from adding things. And so here you can draw that as graph um, where you have, we've got 50% parallelizable, 75% um, 90% and 95% the maximum speed ups you can have with the number of processes, right? So this is a diminishing returns. Um, most of you will not have 65,000 processes in your machine, I would assume, um, but you may well have eight to 16. Right? So some of you will have eight core machines, which could have could be hyper-threaded and have 16 threads running on eight cores um, on some of your gaming machines. Uh, and even then, like if it's not massively parallel that you'll also be just yet starting to run out of value um, on normal tasks. Okay, so is it a waste of time to worry about multi-threading? Okay. Um, it's often it is a waste of time, but right, it's, a, it's always fun, right? I honestly optimizing code like setting it up and having it run in parallel kind of fun not always useful okay so what you need to do is you need to ask yourself is it computationally intensive um is it um gui based right if it's gui based humans are remarkably slow input devices and so actually even if you just allocate some of the time on your main thread to getting input from your users you'll be fine, right? Um, what, <laughs> and, you know, that's that's just, you know, humans are the slowest bit of the system. Uh, if, however, you are computationally intensive and you know that, that you're going to do the same process to a lot of different data, yeah, multi-threading, data parallel could be great. Um, we've got some ideas of producers and consumer models. And, and when you do OpenMP, this is the idea that, that there are there are tasks that need to be done, and there are consumers that can compute those tasks. And a producer-consumer model is that you have basically a queue of tasks to be done. The producers organize the tasks that need to be done, and the consumers execute those. Now, this is actually how basically the um, Unity Entity Component System works, and its job system, which we'll get to later. And the jobs are these small units of work and the threads are consumers, and the job allocator is the producer of jobs, jobs to be done, and the consumers are the threads that run on the CPU. Okay, so, um, so yeah, work out in what, like, um, what kind of task it is. Do you have to wait for slow resource? If you're waiting for disk or you're waiting for net, um, then... <laughs> you might want heavyweight threads, right? So for example, uh, when you are waiting for network input, you'll often and you almost certainly have to spin up a thread to handle the network communication so that um, when you have the, the, the information coming in from the network, you've got some part of your machine waiting and listening for that input. Otherwise, you have to check it as part of your normal processing and that becomes really a, 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 a it can slow the rendering down. You don't want to slow the rendering down just because you've got some packets and the other plans, right? So you often spin up another thread for that. Um, you might thread up, spin up a thread and do disk writing asynchronously. Right? This is something I did when I was doing data logging, particularly when I was taking screenshots. So one of the things I was doing when I was, I was programming is, is um, for some of the testing, I would take a screenshot of the game as it was and save it to disk 
so that I could see what the player was doing. I told the players I was doing this, but I'd take, I'd do a, a print screen. The problem is if you do a print screen and it takes main CPU time, you don't want the game to slow down every time it takes a snapshot. And so I, so I, I did the screenshot, then spun up another thread, and that thread iterated through writing the screenshot from RAM onto disk. Because that's a slow process, it takes a long time. If I put it on a separate thread, it won't affect the gameplay. Okay, so that's where I had a big task that was waiting on something really slow, and so I spun it off as a thread so it would run separately. Okay. Um, if you have task parallel, extra threads, games have lots of these. Um, and because we are interested in making games, not just because they're an artistic form, but because we have to find a way of making money to stay alive, um, we are interested in the return on investment. If you do the multi threading, how much do you get back by doing that? How much better is your game because it is running that bit faster? And that's the return on that investment. So you do have to be clear-headed about what you're getting back by putting in the extra time, right? Um, and, you know, for, for some tasks, uh, you might say, well, actually, rather than try and make my program more complex, how about I just spin up a different executable? that deals with something so you know i could have a different executable um that was basically in 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 unreal it's like a service running on the blueprints um uh, and the on the the ai um but you could say well okay rather than having multi-threaded how about i have the ai do multi-process communication i'll just have it communicate with the main thread right and then my ai is its own game running on its own thread Right? And it will communicate, it will be fine, and they won't, it won't ever compete, and I just prioritize the executable here. Um, the problem there is that you get you have a whole program that you have to then spin up and have it communicate, and that can be challenging. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm yawning. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's late, but it shouldn't be that late. Um, okay, so um, this is where I would normally... And I, I left this in because, you know, we're a class. Um, and I'll try this online. I'll try it on, online in Discord. So if we just jump into Discord, the evening we're in. Right, so um, now age might not be the best uh, thing to calculate because I'm sure that you guys, well, some of you might not want to share your ages. How about instead of age, we calculate your average address number? Right, so the address there, don't give us the street you're on, just give us the street number. Right, so um, I live in 24 Green Street, so mine would be 24. So I could say 24. Um, and so that's, that's where I live. Uh, we have a 12. Now, so the, the question is, how do we calculate the average of the class? Right, so if people put in their, their, their numbers in there, um, we then have a whole bunch of random numbers which are, are going to be added together. Now, a linear way of doing this, yeah, that's that's enough. We can we can use that group. So we've got, that's great. Thank you, Andrew. So if I did linear, I would take 24 and 12 and go 36 and add 12, 40, 48, and add 11, 59, 111, 122, 126, 136. 136 divided by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 136 divided by 8 is 80, and 56 is 7, and so 17 would be the average the average address number, if I get that right. Oh, and someone added one. Ah, what do I do now? Okay, so that's, that's a linear process, right? And that would be your linear process. And we've got a 61, a 33, and a 10. Um, of course, I have no idea whether these are lies or not. <laughs> you, you can give me any number that you like. But we had 17 up to the last ones. Um, I think the 61 will probably dump us up more to like 20. 
Um, but we did get a seven and a ten, so that could bring us up. So um, now that was me thinking in a linear way. If I think in a parallel way, rather than using my brain to do all of the calculations, a big long sum and then a divide. What I could do is I could say, right, um, I need to pick some of you, some of your CPUs that are in your brains to do some of the work. Now, one of the ways I could do this is say, right, I will take and I will see people who contributed. So um, myself, Sian and Jürgen, the three of us could just take three numbers each, or four numbers each, say, I think we're up to about that. So if we take four numbers each, right, the three of us could just go, right, we'll add those four numbers together and divide by four, and we put that number down, right? So so then what I do is I'm, I'm not having to serially step through all of the numbers, I'm just stepping through some section of them. We then do that for, I take the first four, so it's 24 and 24 is 48, um, 59, right? So I would write um, 4 times equals oh, get my numbers right there that one um, equals 59 uh, and then uh, Stian could take the next four from um, board through Ludwig and Victor and Christopher. And then um, Jürgen, you could take uh, Eric um, Katzper, um, Othius, and Daniel. Right? So so now we are I'm I'm doing four and Stian's doing four and Jürgen did four, right? And then the idea would be, ah, we can then merge those ones because they were still being, and so I'd need to actually go equals 59 and then I'd have to edit that and actually give it as a divided by four, which is 40, 19, uh, four, nine. So this would be 14.75. Oh, comma 75 because we're Norwegians, aren't we? Now, yeah, so, so the idea here is that we've broken the task down and instead of me using just my linear head, I said, can I divide this task and make other threads do it, right? And then to do the final calculation, we would take those three and average those three, right? So you add those three together and then divide by three, okay? So, um, and then when I, when I do that, what we can do is we can say, so do that. How, how many requests did we make, right? So um, when we were kind of looking for information, we got the same number of requests. How many additions did we do? Well, we each did three, and then we did a divide, and then we did another, uh, so we each did four, and then we did a divide. And then to get the final number, we'd have to add three together again. So we end up doing more additions, right? So we do more work. However, when we look at the time slice, because if we look at one execution thread, I only have to do four additions, a division, and then three additions and a division. So that's been nine operations. Now, because we had 12 numbers, I would do 12 additions and a division. So um, so there I'm talking about 13 operations, right? and, and if I do this parallel, I'm down to 9, right? 9 down from 13 doesn't sound great. However, if we use, that's because I've gone from one thread to three threads. Also shows that there's a limit because there's this organizational bit. I can't, I, I didn't just divide the, t the task by three. I still had to look at what's the time slicing of an individual thread going through this, right? Because um, I can use Stian and Jürgen while I'm doing the parallel bit, but I still have to do the summation at the end, and that still has to be a single threaded activity, right? So um, now, that's not much of a speed up when you've only got 12 items. Trust me, if we had 
you know, a thousand items, thousand in the class, and you're going through all of them, then breaking up into um, 20 or 30 people, each doing a block of um, 10 or 20, um, then you suddenly see much faster times because you've got more threads operating on the task. Okay, so so that's kind of one of the, the and you can see that there is an issue between that serial and parallel. There is a the the breaking it up and the recombining it adds some overhead, right? Um, and that's why we get that that limit on thread. Now, hopefully, you've done some design patterns. I hope all of you have heard of the singleton pattern. Um, if you haven't heard of the singleton pattern, it's an extremely common pattern in games, so you should probably go away and learn it. Um, uh, so thank you very much for, for um, Steve and Jürgen for jumping in and, and commenting. That's really good. Um, and I'm glad I've still got some people at least online. Um, so singletons are what we call, um, are, are mostly thread safe. They're the idea that, that your program will have a um, there. your program will have some items, items like the keyboard where there's only one of and so you want it to only exist once so there's a design pattern called a singleton if you don't know it we can go away and talk about design patterns in fact if you want to know more about design patterns we can put we can rank that higher in the course and we can give you a game design pattern later the singleton can be thread safe is mostly thread safe if you create it before you spin up most of the threads right and that's usually when it's created however um if you are creating a singleton in two different threads right so let's say you've got a a um the the keyboard singleton that's right? managing input and you've got that lazy instantiation so you're waiting until it gets used before you create that singleton and you spin up an ai player and the the normal player and in the player creation you go oh i want to access the keyboard and so you access the keyboard now if you've just got a single player it accesses the keyboard the keyboard spin singleton spins up everything's fine if you use the default player class and you create a second player, when that second player arrives, if you swap out at the right time, you're both trying to create the singleton instance. And that's when you can run into what we call race conditions, where depending on whether the AI gets there first or you get there first, one or other of you may create the singleton and if you the other one creates singleton before you you know that the other one's doing it you can both have your own copy of a unique structure and that will break things okay so you do need to create what what we call critical sections and create a lock on things like this thing that singleton patterns on creation now this concept of having to lock down part of your program to make it thread safe as soon as there are threads, you are going to start having problems with things overwriting each other and not working well together. So if we have a look um, you know, at an example of other problems where things lock up, right? We've got two multiple things. Um, the classic one is the dining, dining philosophers problem. Um, first described by Dykstra in 65, um, quite a long time ago. And his situation was there are five philosophers and there are five forks. And you need two forks to eat. Don't tell me, don't, don't explain to me why you need two forks to eat. Apparently, Dykstra ate his, his spaghetti in an odd way, but he used two forks. Um, so the idea is there are five forks, five philosophers. Each philosopher is holding a fork. Got my fork. Um, but you need two forks to eat. And so what... I've seen this used with chopsticks. It makes a lot more sense with chopsticks. Um, so you can have a chopstick, but you don't have a second chopstick, so you can't pick anything up. Um, and so the idea is that we get into what's called deadlock, because while we have the five philosophers all sitting around the table, and they've all got their one device, so chopstick or fork, 
and if nobody and everybody's waiting to get two so they can finish eating but no one will give up the resources they have so that other people can operate so a lot of what your operating system does to deal with deadlock on devices like keyboards and screens and mice and and cameras is to have a de a deadlock and release right so when i when i say right i want the camera if i get bumped as a process i release the camera now sometimes you'll find and you might have found this with windows occasionally when you go to delete a file Windows will say something like, oh, can't delete that. That's in use by another program. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever had Windows tell you, no, no, you can't delete that file. It's in use by another application. Yes. Have you removed all of the other running applications and it still won't let you delete that file until you freaking restart your machine and kill everything? Right? Because... I've had that shit happen to me in Windows. Now, what happened is the program put a lock on that file and exited before it could unlock the file. Right? And Windows hasn't cleaned up after itself. Right? And that that kind of deadlock where, oh, I've, I, I've grabbed that file and then I'm waiting to do some processing. Like, you know, I've got a file and I want to print, All right? So I've got a file and I'm currently using the keyboard and I want the printer, All right? So I'm saying, right, I've got, I'm, I'm using the keyboard, so I've got the keyboard control, but I need to print something. There's another process that, that has the printer, but it's waiting for me to press a key on the keyboard and so it's waiting for keyboard input. Now, if those two are sitting there deadlocked, one won't give up the keyboard, Right, because it wants to print, and one won't give up the printer because it needs a keyboard input. And then our program freezes, and we have to kill something. Ah, forcing. Yes, if you use the, the RM-F on the file in command line, you can tell the Windows to ignore its locks, which is good, right? Because yes, you can do it that way as well, which is useful. Um, but this idea, it, it was an execution, it was an example of something locking a file right and that's what these these programs are doing um there's lots of resources you can go and have a look at those to to kind of look at the examples and some of the problems with multi-threading and locks you will find um locking behavior you will find race conditions you will find a lot of problems when you start having multiple threads doing things um so some of the examples we do to, to kind of make things multi-threaded is um, one of the examples is called decomposition where we find the smaller units of work so that's what i was doing when i was counting the the addresses right so your home address um is that i was trying to take the large summation and chunk it decompose it into smaller parts right and that's where we split it we isolate and we do those things separately um we have replicate and, um, and, and reduce, which is different operations on the same data. So we take, so we've, if we've got a stream of data coming through and we have a bunch of different operations, what we can do is we can set those, those operations up to be a stream. And so one piece of data comes in, does this operation, and then it moves to the next operation, then it moves to the next operation, moves to the next operation. But as soon as this one moves out of this thread the next piece of data comes in and so i then fill up the stream with each next bit of data to be processed right so again get the big you know tr basically triangle of what's being processed and time because they're each moving from one part of the factory line to the next so it becomes like just when you set up a factory line you you're doing a different processing on the car body each time but you've got more than one car being produced on the factory line at a time, right? And so that's the replicate and reduce. Um, and the divide and conquer is different data, same operation. We were doing a sort of divide and conquer because we had divide and conquer because we had different numbers coming in. 
but we're doing the same addition division, right? So that's the kind of divide and conquer. Um, and that's how we decompose that. Now, the staggered pipeline with multiple threads, um, do a small part, pass it on um, different data, same operation, right? So that was, um, um, yeah, same, well, yeah, so, so different data, same operation, same operation, different data, same data, right? So, so you've got to kind of work out what it is you're doing um, and how you stagger pipelines and how you create multiple threads which are like, so the, the GPU is the same operation, right? So the GPU is actually made up of, of what's called a wave of, for processing. And so that's where each of the cores of your like thousand processing units in your GPU, each of them do exactly the same thing. But the different data is different areas of the screen are considered the different data. So that's the same operation on a, on a, different area of the screen. Right? So it's doing the same rendering task, but it's just doing it with different, with the different data. And so that's where you have that pipeline and that's what the GPU does. Um, you need to do the identification of your task to work out what kind of task you have, to work out what kind of multi-threading you should do. Okay, so how does this work in modern game engines? Well, the Unity game engine, um, in, so we're in Unity 2020 and probably from, I think, 18, was moving to the job system. Uh, and there's a YouTube video there, so if you want to go away and watch that um, after this or in parallel, if you just pause me and go away and do that, and you'll, you won't be able to ask me questions, but at least you'll be, you know, have seen the video. Um, that talks about how Unity moved to the Entity Component System and what it calls jobs, right? The job system. Now, um, how Unity works is it said, okay, we already have an internal threading system in Unity. We and and if we create more tasks to achieve, threads, then there are CPUs then you get thread swapping, right? And your your processor gets inefficient. So they have these a, a, a job pooling. They have a pool of things they can do. So what they do is they, they say, okay, how many CPUs do you have? Oh, you've got eight. Okay, what we'll do is we'll create eight threads. Those threads will run, each one run will run on the each of the, the cores and we'll get those threads to do different jobs and so that's what the job system is basically the job system is queue lots of little tasks for your cpus to do and unity has a has heavier weight threads which will pick up a job do a job and return the answer okay so it kind of sets up almost this virtual machine with multiple processing being done on it and instead of using the operating system to manage the thread swapping in and out and the full context switching it's basically sat itself down on all of the threads on all the cpus and said no no i'm taking them over i will decide when i do things rather than let the operating system do it okay and there's the they, they had a new compiler called the first compiler that that compile com, compiles these jobs into things that can be run on those threads uh, and they have because they've tried to make jobs narrower in execution focus and safer to use because it's very easy to break things when you do full multi-threading um, and so they've also made something called the, the native container which is for storing the results from threads in a safe location um, and it's what's called data-oriented technology, moving away from object-oriented to being data-oriented. And in data-oriented, we think about parallelism, we think about functions separate from data because we expect function to work and data to pass through it. So those three years of university, we have learnt, two years, we have learnt to do object-oriented programming, yet not what we do anymore. Um, games have moved away from OO, 
programming, um, particularly for high performance, because the CPU and GPU are not object-oriented hardware. They are function and data. They are data processing systems, not object processing systems. And so if you want to extract the most that you can out of your CPU and GPU, you have to stop thinking in OO terms and start thinking in functions and data as separate things. Okay, so useful concepts when you're learning to program, not useful once you're doing this empty component system. It's also one of the, the hardest things for a lot of programmers who have just done a bit of programming and gone to Unity to understand is that they're no longer doing, that. they've got to kind of think outside the square of the OO language. So, as I said, the job system, one thread per CPU core. Each thread takes jobs off a queue of threads. Um, there is an I job, which is a class in Unity that you create, which is one of these small jobs, does a small task. It also has separately the I job parallel four. Now, this is because we know that what a lot of you do when you're programming is do a for loop that goes through a bunch of data. Now that seems an obvious thing to parallelize because it's for loop and I know it's gonna go through all the data. So instead of me having uh, you having to kind of internally spin up a whole bunch of jobs inside a for loop. How about I just jump the jobs outside of the for loop and say, hey, this is going to be a parallel for. I want you to take every item inside this for loop and make a job out of it and send it off to the threads to do all in parallel. It'll be fine. All right? So it, so these the I job is where you make each thread yourself. The I job parallel for is where you use your knowledge that the for loop is, is going to be parallel to create that for you. Uh, you also have to understand how it uses comp um, on the handle to the job to know whether or not all the previous jobs are finished, right? And that's where you've done complete of all the jobs that were in the queue. So you have a, a, a handle on the, on the queue that was sent to the job system. Um, and so when you're actually programming with the Entity Component System, using the job system in um, uh, Immunity, you need to use Complete to synchronize things. Um, and because it's integrated into the event processing system, um, then you are actually kind of operating on the same, at the same level as the game engine itself, right? Which could, gives you a bunch of positives. Okay, so um, now I have mentioned a couple of times the word race condition. So, race condition. A race condition is where something's happening in your program, and if I do one line of execution, I get a different answer to if I do a second line of execution. Now, how might this happen? Well, if I had two functions and both of them returned numbers and I set A to being some asynchronous capital A function and then later I set A to being some asynchronous capital B function. Because those are asynchronous, I'm not necessarily guaranteed that capital A will come back before lowercase a. That would be terrible, right? Because I don't know whether it should return, whether it will return 10 or 20. Because these are asynchronous, I don't know when they return. So now if you're starting if you're spinning up an asynchronous function and you're returning it to a local variable, um, this would be considered completely dangerous and stupid behavior, so you'd never do it. Um, so usually what we do is when we'd spin up an asynchronous function, we would return instead of returning it to A we would return it to position one in an array. And B would return to position two in an array. And only once we'd got all of the things returned, would we then say, ah, all the asyncs are done, I can now complete. And in fact, um, that's what Unity does with this, where I said back here, where I said the native, this, this native con um, container, that is the container that deals with 
multiple threads all wanting to write into the shared piece of memory so it creates a special array where each thread each job can only write into its part of the array once everybody's written into the array that native container is then used to sum up things or evaluate things or which work out which one has an answer or or whatever the combining part of it is that is a is a safe array to use and it enforces that each job can only write into its allocated position not just randomly in that array okay so there is machinery in um, unity to protect you from these raid conditions now unreal uses the f runnable and f runnable thread so it allows you to do full heavyweight threads it also has a parallel four process right so you can use threads for data parallel by using a parallel four um, feature in um, unreal and it will allow you to optimize in the same way that unity does um, now it doesn't have a full entity component system and so it doesn't have that the same job system but those runnable threads, you can manage those yourself, okay? For C++ programmers, and I won't go into SFML and, and, and Godot and Goda um, and all those, Godot and all of those, but for, for C++, one of the simplest and the fastest things that you guys can do, and, you know, I'll, I'll take a break in a minute, and we can go away and we spin up some Visual Studio, and we can show you OpenMP, um, it is honestly doing include omp.h because all of your compilers have the omp system in them, basically. Um, so you just include the omp.h and then you have this hash pragma omp parallel for and then you can you can put that around a for loop you define and what it will do is it will parallelize that for loop and make it run much faster. Okay, so it's one of the simplest ways that you can parallelize something that you know is going to step through a whole bunch of code. Okay, or repeat itself many times within a frame. Now you can see what this is doing. Um, this code here is um, going from one to um, n. And it's terrible that it's starting at, at, well, it starts at one because it goes i minus one. And it takes a i plus a minus, and a i minus one, adds them together and then divides those two, okay? And puts that into i. So from the second element, which is, because zero is the first element, from the second element, position one through to n, b will now be the average of the a pixels of the two nearest a pixels okay so it so it, it's kind of doing a slight a, a, a one pixel blur over that array now b can be calculated completely independently of any other b being calculated so that's why that's a safe operation to do in a omp parallel okay um so that was my quick and unfortunately one hour introduction to um, this this idea of parallelization uh, and then I thought we'd have a break and if you want you can ask me questions we can also talk about the games you're developing and we can also go through I could show you me doing this little wee OpenMP optimization on C code this idea of a parallel for loop is where you get probably 80 or 90 percent of your speed up for most of the things you're doing um, some things you need to do, so definitely, you spin up a thread to handle networking, you, you can have a thread that handles rendering, you can have a thread that does world update, and you can have a thread for AI, right? Most eight core machines, they'll be fine, four core machine will be fine. That, actually, that, that just makes handling those a wee bit easier and makes sure that they all run, but the user doesn't really notice much of a really massive speed up because of that, it just makes your job as a programmer clearer and more obvious and it means that certain things don't slow down OpenMP is where you can get quite a few nice speed improvements on part of the code that's actually slow okay 
So um, I'm going to have a, a break. I'll grab myself a drink and I'll come back and we can show you Visual Studio and particularly the profiler in Visual Studio because that what actually allows you to optimize and know when you're actually optimizing things rather than just tinkering around the edges. Okay, because stopwatch time, right, isn't that particularly useful when you're trying to work out have I optimized this enough? Okay. Any questions so far before I before we have a quick break? Any uh, any questions that you desperately need me to answer before I go get a drink? Nope, I can. I can't hear anyone asking me questions. I can't see anyone writing any questions. Is it a nice day in in Yervik? Night time here. It was a terribly rainy day today. Very windy. Lots of rain. Not very nice. Ah, it's a bit cloudy. That's all good. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, I can't see the sun at all. So at least you've got a little bit of daylight. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll grab, grab myself a drink and I'll come back and then we can answer some questions either um, about um, OpenMP. Do you guys want me to do the OpenMP thing? I mean, I don't have to, right? If you guys aren't actually interested, I don't need to run up Visual Studio and um, call my team. But, you know, I'm quite happy to show you me using Visual Studio um, and uh, open recent. Um, oh, actually, do I have? I wonder if I have it somewhere in my code. Nope, I can just create a new rep repository. And I'll use a. Boy, where's my C? Here we go. That's better. Um, MV project C++ no starter. Cool. Okay, it's been a while. I haven't actually created new projects in in C++ for a while. Okay, we'll just go with that one. And we'll call this uh, OMP test. And put it in my D drive. And in my and get go. And I'll put that in in INT where are we? MP3601. There we go. Shoot code. Right, so you can see I've actually got um, playing, doing random playing with codes and design pants and high scores. I've got quite a few. Um, let's go new. Okay, so we'll, we'll put it in there. Um, select it. Now, I do actually have a whole bunch of code that I can spin up and show you. I think I do even have some OpenMP code on here. Um, so, yep, that's, that's in front. But we can, we can take that break. I'll come back. Um, I'll have a look in my... Um, Git folder to see if I've got some, some of the... Because we would force on it, I've got a bunch of, of code that's related to OpenMP in my INT. Where is it? Um, these shared code files. So let's see. Uh, testing. Testing. Right, these were, aha, those were projects and students. Um, I've got my math library. Yep, that's that's me doing some interesting stuff. So let's bring it up into Visual Studio. Okay, so um, 
I'll play with it, but I'll go get myself a drink. You guys have a break. See you in five, 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, see you in five. Make it uh, 11.25. I haven't touched this stuff for quite a long time. Aha, right, that was me making my own libraries. Um, kind of fun to do. Okay, anyway, I'll be back in a sec.
Okay, so. Hmm. I've made myself a nice hot cup of tea. Okay, so. Um, oh, actually, I should put my ears in in case one of you actually wants to talk to me. Um, not that you're very vocal often in the evening. Um, so. Pardon me. Um, So these were the tasks I had in um, the, uh, the ready, and you can see we had more tasks to create. Um, and I think if I, oh, now it's going to try and load up a different Go away. Certainly made those that file large. Um, works. Yep, okay, so. That's that one. That one, that one. Come on, show me one. Right, so that was the, the, the graphs example. So, so we were actually graphing the, the examples of these. Um, so if I grab this and open it with nineteen. Um, so here you can see this is no code I prepared earlier. Um, oh, okay, so. That, is that going to restart? No, it's not going to restart. Um, so I'd have to go to there and go to there and go. Now it restarts. Okay. Right. Okay, we're good. That's all good. Um. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, people. Um, I'm I'm happy to say hi to everyone in Uvic. You guys are amazing. Um, actually, I've been describing some of the teaching that I was doing in Uvic and some of my approach to teaching to to one of my colleagues here. Um, and he says I must have been living in a fantasy land where you know students actually care about learning stuff. And that my colleagues are supportive, and you know why did they come back to this horrible place when I was living in this fantasy land where everything seemed wonderful? So apparently, I say lots of nice things about you guys in music. Um, so, so yeah, no, I um, there are some nice things about you. It really is. Um, there is certainly a lot of a lot of aspects of of being in a community of people who want to learn. That's much better than being somewhere where everyone's paying lots of money and everyone's having to work multiple jobs and everyone's under a lot of stress. So, um, okay, anyway, back to what I prepared earlier. Um, if I can, without getting my program to crash, it's good. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm lecturing, so. <laughs> okay, so what we've got um, is, um, actually, sits like this. Um, okay, so we go here. Uh, now, I don't know if you guys can see that particularly well. Um, like, I could probably make the, the code a bit, ah, probably good. It's recording, it'll be fine. Um, it's already quite large, so. This is C++ code. As you can see here, I've got this OMP, um, the including OMP. I've also included random so that we can do some um, random number generation because that usually takes some time. So here I've got constant number of runs. 
uh, and in this case it is uh, a million. I then generate um, a set of random numbers. So I use the random device and I make a bunch of, of uniformly distributed random numbers, right? Just just so I can have a a, a set of, of random numbers to use. Um, And here, what we're doing is is I'm I'm incrementing number of hits because uh, what this is calculating is it does it uses a random sampling to calculate pi by calculating it by as you can see here this this function here x squared plus y squared is less than some floating point number. Um, in this case, less than one. That is basically the radius of one. And if you find something inside the area, you add. And if you find, and so you get, you get two random numbers and you check them and you see if they fall inside. Now, um, this is an OMP parallel four with a reduction where I'm going to use hits as a special um, function this bit here is doing and it means that I can it creates basically a, an array of the hit value and then once it puts all of its results into hits it then add it reduces that and adds it all together at the end right so that's the that's how that's going to work um, and then I work out pi to being the number of hits divided by the number of runs. And we multiply it by four because it's only a quadrant, it's only at the corner. So it, it tries to work out four. Now, um, this is, so that is the parallel, OMP parallel four with reduction. This is OMP, OMP parallel four done where instead I use what's called the pragma OMP atomic because when you're doing multi-threading you have to separate out uh, code that is only allowed to ever run once all right what one one person at a time in this case it runs it as uh, each of the threads that is created by that for loop uh, can own it, it, it has to atomically add one because one of the problems is if i took if hits was 10 and I had one program go, oh, it's currently 10, add one to it. And I had a different, um, different loop go, oh, it's currently 10, how about I add one to it? And they, they both set it to 11, we would lose one of those updates, right? And that would be a problem for the parallel system. Um, and here is the last, another type where I'm doing a run with critical sections. So here we have OMP parallel four. Um, but what I do is I set up instead of an OMP critical add simple. And so this is a, again telling the com compiler, oh, you're going to parallelize this for loop, but you're going to create a critical section and it's going to be the next line is going to be critical. And I'm going to use the flag add simple so that no one else who says, hey, this is critical section called this will enter that until I'm finished. Okay. And then what I do is this would be running the code with each of these. Now, I think if it's, if it's control F5, is that build and run? Or is that just build? Build and run. Okay. Why did that? not compile properly. Oh, <laughs> that's because I only opened the CPD. I didn't actually make this the executable. Uh, the executable is currently Hello World, and that's uh, not in this. Right. Whew. I was thinking I was crazy there for a minute um, and saying, well, what happened? So. OMPPS, this is currently the executable. So um, what I can do is if I just do all and copy, 
and let's just high stream it's going to main there's nothing else in it okay um, I'll just paste it in here and I'll get rid of this main right okay that makes me feel that uh, we had the same main I oh, yeah. okay that makes me feel a bit better I'm not going completely crazy um, control f5 bang let's see aha so um uh, go away um so what you can see here is that it's run three times it's actually very hard potentially for you to see uh if i make this properties mm, font 28 or 24 and yeah oh a bit easier to see um so it's got 3.3.143 so it's done a reasonable way of getting to it right so each of the methods has generated something like um pi but i haven't worked out how long each of them take right and actually one of the things we we're doing um, in the assignment was um, getting people to work out how long each of these would take right uh, and so if I run our profiler so um, if tools and it's under um, Performance profiler. And I can do CPU usage. Um, I can do event viewer. I can do GPU usage. Uh, it's not going to do GPU. So I'll do CPU usage and event profiler. And we'll start. Now this is a automatic profiler that will show me what happened um and stop clicking okay so um this will have so here you can actually look at, at the profile of what happened and where it spent at time right um and so this is this is one way you try and find where things are slow and you can see that there are there is at, at different times, I've got a different hit on my CPU. None of it used all of the processes, particularly harsh. Um, but so run with critical and run with atomic were taking up the time. And she run with critical section um, had uh, total CPU at 67%, run with atomic at 33%. So, um, so from the profi profiler, we can actually look at that and go oh okay so um which were which were slow now if you wanted to get the program to actually slow down you can do some time stamps and one of the things we're doing is is like how long will this take um with the different um algorithms so if we go into here uh and instead of doing that how about we make it take 10 times longer um and save and then control f5 um, and now you'll see it spins two three one two three four one two and four right okay so pressing the key so if I now spin it up with the profiler um, so under that, and we go start. Right, you can see that it's not using much CPU thread. There was a wee blip there, and a wee bit blip there. And we can do, oh, 
and I think it, it needs you need to stop it before it will show you the 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 process so we can click there and loading data um, it's taking its time to get usage no data on current filters that's a bit odd oh, we won't save that anymore and try running it again and I'll see if we can get it to actually do what it's supposed to um, now if you're running a large program um, it is useful to have the um, Solutions that's um, to debug, switch to release to configure more. Okay, so um, because we're in debug, each of those was. Ah, right, now that's actually interesting. Um, I forgot to say that. In debug, it adds lots and lots of overhead, so some of your pro parallel processing won't work. So remember, we were taking about four seconds. Let's run that again, control F5, and release and see how much faster it is. One two, three, all right? So each of those was done in about, yeah, much, much faster um, than, let's, project, and let's start on, Right, now it's actually automatically stopping because it knew that it was what it was doing. Aha! Uh -huh. Now it spent a whole bunch of time in the waiting for me to press the keys. So, so that was the, the call tree. Um, I can also look in and find out what was taking time and how it was taking time and what functions were called. Um, and that was waiting on ex external time. Um, Queries, yes, it's okay. So don't say. But um, if we have a look in here, uh, what I can also do is say, well, what what would happen if I was doing this without doing an OMP parallel, right? Because I haven't actually shown you what it works without um, the parallel. So to do that, how about we take the critical section out and we just do that one, and we do that one, and then go. Control E5. So the first one should take about one second. The second one should take one second. Third one. Oh, that took also no time. Um, it is an optimized compiler. So let's make it bigger and see if we can make it struggle. CPUs. Took a lot longer. Um, and what we'd like to look at is can we get. We're only using Weber users who use a lot of process memory. Um, how are we going for. Ah, oh, ha, you know what I haven't done? This is not very smart of me, but you know what I haven't done? I haven't set OMP up properly. That's why they're all taking side whether I have OMP or not. So, um, OMP Visual Studio. Um, there is actually a setting in Visual Studio to run OMP. Uh, so I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but um, yeah, when something doesn't seem to work, you should go and look for the documentation, actually find the documentation and go, oh, 
what am I doing wrong? Why isn't this doing what I expect it to do, which is actually go multi-core, use all of the CPUs and do a big burst across all the CPUs. Um, so what I'm looking for is, um, the recommendations on the turning on OMP. Um, so it's there, but in Visual Studio, um, definition turns, yes, 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 all of that's fine. Uh, execution model, appliance, reference. Renewables. Um, Schedules. Right. So OMP, there is actually, you need to basically turn on OMP. Um, build OMP test, OMP test, rebuild. Where is the setting? So there's a setting that I have to turn on OMP. So when I'm um, when I run OMP, I do have to tell it to actually um, probably in the project settings. Sorry about this; it's been a while since I've done this. Um, not account settings. Saves, recent, nope, um, edit. Turning, let's try turning on OMP Visual Studio. Because there is a, a Right, open the project property page, expand the configuration property. Right. Set the compiler option in the Visual Studio development environment. Open the property pages and see the set the C compiler and build properties in Visual Studio. So uh, Projects property pages and then configuration properties, C and language modify the OpenMP support. Okay, sorry, that's what I was missing. Um, so I need to go project properties C um, checking what I was configuration properties. Uh, configuration properties as C++ C, C++ language and language, which is language, and OMP support. OMP support, there it is. There's the open, open MP support, and say yes. Ha! <sighs> so, now apply and go OK. Whew, OK. So, now I'll actually go uh, Control F5. Now it will build it, and in theory build it, with OMP support turned on. That one did. I can't really tell if that one took that much longer. Um, so uh, OMP. So that's now turned to yes. Um, set the compiler option programmatically. See, right, so you can actually set the compiler option programmatically. Copy. Ugh, okay, that's ugly. Um, so yeah. So. Uh, so in this code, you can see it's doing make it big. You guys can all see it. Um, again here, 
it's using this something similar with the, the sum being reduced. It also has a private x, which is because this x by x is um, the um, local to this particular for loop, and so it has to make it private because it wants to keep it separate for that little for loop, right? So this is kind of understanding some of the, the coding that's going on and trying to kind of do, basically this was this tick count is what we were trying to get people to, to, to implement. Um, and so uh, I can actually basically do dw start tick count. That's what we're going to do for the timing to work out how, how long things were gonna take. And we have to include um, those those timings to make that work, right? So that was, that was this initial quick work out how to do the timing around each of these calls. Um, so we could actually do something like that. Oh. Yeah, so that would be um, run critical test. And D, uh, so that's steps would be N, which we don't actually need to know. So we can just say, this is also was another way of working out um, pi with um, tick count um, and d would need to be a float so i'll need to grab this and go ah don't actually need to do that um but yeah, so you can see that there are there are things out there which are are doing something similar. Uh, so this is partly why we were using that code because it's a simple way of doing it. Um, and the idea here is that that you can compare different ways of processing and uh, run them in parallel or run them independently. Now, one of the things you also have to be careful of is that. Um, Sometimes your compilers will also optimize things for you in much faster ways than you intend them to, right? So um, the Visual Studio compiler may actually be able to run things more optimally than you intend it to. So until you run the, yeah, that last one took a little bit longer than the other two, um, I think. So, and let's go to the, Test and actually that debug performance profiler. And let's see if we can get this to default high 4000 samples. Apply, OK, start. Let's see if we can get it to. See, it doesn't really seem to be spinning up my CPU that much. Task manager. What does the task manager think? Well, the task manager thinks it's running running seventy percent of the the CPU. Um, see, the problem is, as I was saying, I have OBS running on sixteen on one of my cores. This is running on. We've got Discord on another core. So a Visual Studio on another core. So I already have quite a few of my cores already running. So the system isn't able to utilize OMP very well because I'm doing all of these other things, right? And so um, in terms of power usage, it, it doesn't have a lot of spare capacity because I'm streaming to you guys, um, which also influences its, its ability to go faster um, than than yeah what it would otherwise right um let's actually stop looking data okay so but regardless of that um and that's that's omp doing some of its stuff um the this seems to be having problems 
before it was giving you good diagnostic data and it showed you where the, the time was being spent. Um, but now it seems to think that it's mostly being spent in the kernel and the file system and the networking. So I've, I've obviously disconnected it somehow. But, um, let me do it. So yeah, so if you do have some code, um, do look at the, the debug profiler. Um, and the, this performance profiler, and actually, um, so start project, that's what it was. That during gross, okay. Um, you can profile other, but see, see here I'm running at 100% CPU um, now, and still 100% CPU, or 80, yeah, so, so this really is burning through the CPU as much as it can, uh, and while well, it's doing that first processing, and we'll see if it gets to the, ah, that's because I'm running two of them. Then they were burning both. Interesting. Um, so yeah, so um, as you can see, there is like, lots of resource out there, lots of ways of, of thinking about um, like how you get your code to run faster. If you're using um, um, Unity or Unreal, uh, I would actually use those game engines. Both of them have good tutorials um, on Unity and Unreal. So if you have a look at Unity, um, the, the link that I gave you in the slides, which I shared, um, with that link. Uh, ah, hello people who are here. Um, if you have a look at this uh, down the Unity, this YouTube link is a GDC talk. It's a very good talk about how Unity moved to using its entity component system. Okay, so um, if you're using it, go and have a look at what they say there. Go and read the documentation. Um, it is interesting to see how to try and make your code run faster and we are honestly one of the few disciplines in computer science that actually care about speed now as i said at the beginning when i was talking about some of the, the game programming um you also can't rely on some of the theory that you've used in other courses um this is an example where we've moved to data-oriented design, where we don't think about everything being objects, we separate data from functions. Uh, you also can't rely on O notation because memory and the memory footprint is far more important than the CPU processing. Um, so yes, you, you have to be willing to look at what you're currently doing rather than what the theory says because the theory isn't necessarily able to keep up with how many changes are happening in the, the code. Okay. Uh, 